So, um, so I'll go ahead and get started um, as people are still joining the meeting. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy McComb. I'm one of the librarians here in Chelmsford. Before we really get started tonight, I'd just like to share a couple of upcoming programs. Uh, on Thursday, March 31 at 7 p.m., film lecturer Frank Mendoza presents Sidney Poitier, The Man, the Artist, the Reluctant Hero. On Monday, April 4 at 7 p.m., the photographer Bruce Magnuson presents a talk on the life and work of J.M.W. Turner and an overview of the current exhibit at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. On next Thursday, April 7th, New England College professor Maura McNeil will lead a workshop on writing your family story. And finally, Jane O'Neill will be back again in April with a talk on earth art and the artists that use natural materials to create artistic works. For those of you who are new to the Art on Tuesday series, our presenter is Jane O'Neill. Jane holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier's Alzheimer's Cafe, and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Her nonprofit is Culturally Curious. Culturally Curious's mission is to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Tonight, Jane O'Neill has a program that fits nicely with Women's History Month. Flower painting has long been the realm of women artists, so it is not surprising that Georgia O'Keeffe is best known for her revolutionary floral still lifes. Of course, in her eight decade long career, O'Keeffe explored a variety of subjects, including the skyscrapers of New York City and the deserts of New Mexico. This program will shine a light on other subjects and examine the ways O'Keeffe explored ex employed ex abstraction to become known as the quote, mother of American modernism. So thank you all for coming. And with that, I will turn it over to Jane. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you to everyone for taking time out of their night today to learn a little bit more about Georgia O'Keeffe. I think most of us have heard her name. I, I believe she's the most well-known woman artist on the planet, um, but most of us don't know much about her beyond the flower paintings. So we're in for a treat. She painted about 2000 works during her entire career and only about 200 of them are flowers. So there's a lot more to Georgia than meets the eye. And we'll start off with this gorgeous image that's on the screen right now. This is a work that's in the collection of the Chicago Art Institute. And we can see there's maybe some references to something that looks vaguely floral here. We have um, things that sort of look like petals and maybe things that look like waves or smoke over here, but it's all kind of combined with these hard straight lines that, um, that seem to be kind of coming out at a diagonal into our space. It's this um, emphatically modernist painting. So it's just a little bit of a taste, a little bit of a sampling of what we'll see. And for Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, to her, this was, um, this was music. And she actually named it Green and Blue Music. So it's uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, sample of what's ahead, but I didn't want to deny anyone the flower fix. So we'll get started with just a few flowers just to get everybody on the same page um, in terms of um, what George O'Keefe is really best known for. This is the resplendent red canna from 1924. Uh, it's uh, one of her most celebrated, most reproduced flower paintings. And I think there's good reason for that because with a painting like this, which is uh, sort of monumental in scale, it's almost three feet tall in person. Um, with a painting like this, she sort of invites our eye to move along every single undulating line, to examine every ripple, every fold, and each line sort of takes you to a new form, a new color, a new experience, a new sort of uh, moment 
of exploration. Every time I look at this, I'm always sort of surprised to discover the lavender that's in the middle of this red flower painting. She does this all with this crispness, with this uh, clarity that just makes um, exploring it really fun, really rewarding. Now, back to this notion of flower painting as kind of the traditional realm of a female artist. Um, that hasn't always been the case. We're looking at a painting from the 1700s. It's a rare example of a floral still life from um, the Dutch golden era here of, um, of a painting that's done by a female artist. But over the centuries, uh, it, uh, flower paintings and botanical uh, drawings and paintings, they, they became sort of relegated to women in general because it's a, it's a feminine subject matter. But I think the comparison here, I bring it in because I, I think it really highlights what Georgia O'Keeffe was doing so differently from artists that came before her. Uh, prior to her flower paintings, artists were trying to create these really sort of well-balanced bouquets that have nice variety in them and might show um, everything from like bud to blossom to decay. So there's a lot going on over here, but Georgia O'Keeffe shows us that there's a lot going on with a single image. So, so this all begs the question, it, um, would Georgia O'Keeffe really be the most popular woman artist today uh, if she hadn't chosen a traditionally female subject matter, uh, the flowers. If she had never painted a flower, would we know her name today? Uh, what we'll see tonight is that Georgia O'Keeffe has uh, experienced uh, so many struggles that we associate with the modern woman. You know, this, this choice between having a family life and having a career. How do you negotiate the men um, in your life? Uh, where do you find the balance? She was struggling with all of these things the same way that women today struggle with them. And it's important to note that she got started doing this when women were still legally second-class citizens in this country. Women didn't have the right to vote when Georgia O'Keeffe first got started. So um, one last slide, indulge me, with some flowers on it. <laughs> this is um, the uh, uh, two calla lilies on pink on the left. That's from 1928. It's at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Museum. And then over on the right, this incredible painting is called White Iris. It's from 1930 and it's at the Tate London. So I just brought in these last two gorgeous pictures for, um, for this purpose of kind of zooming in with Georgia O'Keeffe, noticing things that maybe we hadn't appreciated um, before or yet. Uh, when she painted pictures like this, a contemporary critic uh, once said something, I'm just going to paraphrase uh, the response here, but essentially he said that these monumental flower paintings make us, the viewer, feel like little butterflies sitting on the petals. And I, they do inspire this sense of awe, and especially in, in the way that they play with um, the this, this sense of scale that we have when we look at them. For Georgia O'Keeffe, she said that these paintings were literally created to make us stop and look. It's like stop and smell the roses, but stop and look at the roses, appreciate the flowers, um, take time out of your day to sort of breathe and enjoy what you're looking at here. So tonight is our opportunity to stop and look and appreciate Georgia O'Keeffe in general. And I should mention these flower paintings very much got her noticed and appreciated because even by the mid 1920s, she was making incredible sums of money from these paintings. She sold one series of six flower paintings for the equivalent of well over $300,000 in today's money. So just a few paintings could, could really set you up. And like I said, she painted more than 2000 works in her life. So, um, so she's doing pretty well for herself, even fairly early on, but I shouldn't get ahead of myself. Let, let's start off with how we'll move through the content for tonight's program. Don't you just love this wry smile on the artist over here? She's about um, 45 years old in this picture. It was taken by um, the man who will meet soon enough, Alfred uh, Stieglitz, the man that she marries um, after she moves to New York City. So we'll start off with an introduction to Georgia O'Keeffe. We'll look at some of her paintings on the subject of New York City, and then 
she begins spending time in New Mexico. We'll look at how the desert sort of transforms her artistic production. We'll wrap up with her experiments in a variety of other media, sort of closer to the end of her life and career. And then we'll finish up with just a few late works and her legacy. So plenty to cover. As usual, I should start talking a little bit faster. So we think of Georgia O'Keeffe as being associated with the city or with the desert, but she was actually born in the Midwest. She was born in um, Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. This is actually the uh, Georgia O'Keeffe historic homestead over here. And she was one of seven children. She was the second uh, born and the first daughter. Here she is in the center with two of her sisters. And so even at a young age, Georgia O'Keeffe was somebody who exhibited this interest and an early inclination in the arts. And her parents, who were dairy farmers, they actually uh, very much supported this. And they ensured that, that Georgia O'Keeffe, along with a few of her sisters, were, um, were getting training in the arts. I, they were taking watercolor classes and other art classes. Um, so before too long, the O'Keeffe's did end up moving from Wisconsin. They moved to Virginia. And Georgia O'Keeffe herself began to uh, sort of zigzag across the country. Oh, I just wanted to show this kind of early interest in the arts. This is a drawing that she made when she was 13 years old. So as I was saying, she's moving around quite a bit as a, as a teenager and as a young adult, um, from Wisconsin to Virginia, Texas to um, South Carolina to Chicago and all over. Um, she would, she, she got great training in the arts. She went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She also studied at the Arts, at the, um, arts League in um, New York City. And, um, and then every time she tried to sort of launch her career, there was a great big illness that kind of set her back and sent her home to, um, to her parents' house in Virginia. At one point, she she, um, she got the measles, and at another point, I believe she had a typhoid fever. So she had um, a little bit of this kind of frailty associated with her, but then she'd always get back on her feet and find a new job, sort of launch herself. And, um, and after a, a brief foray in commercial illustration, she began to focus on teaching art in schools. So that was, um, that was ultimately what brought her to the University of Virginia. They had a summer program program specifically designed for women who were art educators. And so between um, 1912 and 1916, Georgia O'Keeffe spent all of her summers there. And by the end, she was actually helping to teach the classes. These are a few uh, um, uh, works that she created sort of in response to one particular philosophy that she was exposed to while she was at the uh, University of Virginia. And this was a philosophy that probably transformed her entire approach to art. She was exposed to the ideas of a philosopher and art, educa art educator named um, Arthur Wesley Dow. And Dow's thinking was that an artist's role was not to try and slavishly copy what they can see in the observable world, which is really what artists have been trained to do for centuries, right? It's like, look at you know the human form and try to capture it perfectly. Instead, Dow said that an artist's job is to uh, make design decisions, make compositional decisions. Uh, he really sort of created uh, this, this sense of freedom in terms of, of, of making a work of art. You, you're not a slave to uh, observed reality. And so Georgia O'Keeffe played with that in her, in her uh, sketch pads at, at the University of Virginia. You see uh, this emphasis on composition. You see some abstraction with these works. And you see an early interest in symmetry, too. We'll see a lot of this in later works as well. So she moves to New York City. She's still really interested in, in, um, in Dow and um, and she's actually working uh, for a summer at a uh, teacher's college in Col at Columbia. And it's at during this time or right around this time that a friend of hers sends some of her drawings onto a small gallery in New York City uh, that was known as uh, 291. And it was a really influential gallery. These are the types of images that were sent on in advance of, um, of Georgia O'Keeffe ever having contact with this gallery. Well, this was a really consequential decision at least on the part of her friend, because the owner or the person who was running uh, Gallery 291 was Alfred Stieglitz, the man who you see in the photograph here. This is a photograph from um, 1950. 
collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here's Stieglitz in that art gallery. Now, before I sort of talk about his reaction to George O'Keefe and, and her works, I do just want to sort of frame up who he is and his outsized influence on the art world at the time that he and Georgia O'Keeffe were connected. So, um, so this gallery, 291, was one of the first uh, galleries that helped to promote this idea that photography could be an art form in and of itself. And Alfred Stieglitz, I should mention, was a photographer in his own right, a leading photographer. But it's interesting to think that even around the turn of the century, after the turn of the century, Americans still kind of had trouble with this notion that photography, which we think of as, as being a document, could be in any way artful. So they pushed through that idea at this gallery. Next, he began to exhibit the artwork of European modern masters, people People like um, Cezanne and Matisse and Picasso. He's bringing um, these innovators to New York City so that people could be exposed to it. And from there, he started shepherding and exalting the careers of American modernists, people like Arthur Dove and Marston Hartley and John Marin. So he's really helping to launch a lot of important careers from this little gallery here. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of who Alfred Stieglitz was, this was the way one Georgia O'Keeffe um, historian, uh, biographer wrote about Stieglitz. She wrote, Stieglitz was an immensely charismatic person, amazingly egotistical and narcissistic, but he had this ability to establish a deep communion with people. And that's sort of how things began with, uh, with him and with Georgia O'Keeffe. They launched a relationship of letters. They were writing to each other all the time before they ever even met. In fact, Georgia O'Keeffe wrote to him, I'm getting to like you so tremendously that it sometimes scares me. Having told you so much of me is there any more than anyone else I know could anything else follow but that I should want you so he sort of teed teed her up to have a great uh, passionate relationship with him. They'd never even met. What could go wrong? Um, well, there's just a few wrinkles here. Alfred Stieglitz was married, and he was also 23 years older than Georgia O'Keeffe. But in 1918, he pays for her to come to New York City, and he was going to underwrite a year of her painting. Um, so pay for her room and board and pay for her materials, just help her to create. These are photographs that he took of her in that first year in New York. City. Now she comes to the city. There's already a, a power dynamic that exists between them. And it gets exacerbated because she falls ill once again. Um, it's a, it's, some historians refer to it as a mysterious illness. It's 1918. I tend to believe it was the Spanish flu. So he's taking care of her. He's providing her room and board. He's, um, he's sort of uh, almost functioning as a muse, you know, paint this, paint this, try this. Uh, but she's very much inspiring his work as well. Uh, he's photographing her all the time. He's very interested in her hands, um, and she's very good at posing with her hands. She's got these long, slender fingers, and of course, they are the source of, um, well, they produce her creative work, so there's, they've got that special allure to them. So they spent several months together with this kind of heat between them before um, Alfred Stieglitz leaves his wife and, um, and begins a, 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 a a, a, a real affair with Georgia O'Keeffe. And from there on, he, um, he begins taking pretty steamy photographs of her as well. He then goes on to exhibit these photographs um, and they caused an absolute sensation. They ruffled a lot of feathers. <laughs> Remember this, well, at the time that they were exhibited, it was 1921. Um, and even today, I think Americans have a really hard time with, um, with, with with fine art photography that is about the nude body. We're okay with paintings, but 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 photography, uh, it just seems a little too real. <laughs> uh, there's there's maybe not enough interpret 
interpretation involved. It just seems like uh, uh, pornography to a lot of people. It's hard to look at these as being works of art. And so it, it was a struggle for Americans about a about hundred years ago as well. And, um, and you could say, you could easily make the case that, that Georgia O'Keeffe's career was launched because of the scandal and the stardom that came from these uh, 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 images of her, uh, these, these nude images of her, you could say a star is born. So, um, so let's turn our attention to what happens to her career after she becomes, a, you know, essentially a household name, at least in, um, in artistic circles. She begins to create um, these kind of stylized, abstracted landscapes. Both of these were inspired by trips to uh, Lake George in upstate New York to visit uh, Alfred Stieglitz's family, extended family. And so we see once again, you know, these beautiful kind of undulating lines, very similar to um, the flower paintings that we had started off with. Some mysterious elements here too. We've got this kind of um, void, this cave here at the center of this picture, but they're tranquil, they're kind of simplified. We've got these soft sensual lines here. We'll be seeing a lot of this in her work. So like I said, uh, Stieglitz uh, finally had, had left his wife, but actually his divorce wasn't finalized until 1924. And it's right around this time that Alfred Stieglitz begins to uh, exhibit Georgia O'Keeffe's work. And he does so every single year until the end of his life. But maybe going back to that notion of a little bit of narcissism, um, his very the very first time he shows her work in a one woman show, he names it Alfred Stieglitz Presents, da, 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 the work of Georgia O'Keeffe. So, um, so we're going to circle back to flowers for just a moment because of that very popular reading of these works of art, the way they're oftentimes understood. And that is that Georgia O'Keeffe's flower paintings are not necessarily just about flowers, but perhaps about, um, about the female anatomy. And, um, and I bring this up only because uh, it was Alfred, uh, actually Alfred Stieglitz who put forward that idea first. It, it was in 1919, I believe. Georgia O'Keeffe vehemently denied that reading of these works. I should mention that the work on the left here is called um, White and Blue Flower Shapes from 1919. And over on the right is called Jack in the Pulpit 4 from um, from 1930, that's at the National Gallery of Art. So, um, so this notion of his uh, of his interpretation of her works of art sort of sticking around <laughs> and seemingly making a bigger impact than um, than than the way she she kind of instructed us to read them is is really interesting. It brings up these questions of whose ideas really matter, who gets to who gets to make the final decision about um, about way, the way these works of art are interpreted. So this is a great photograph of the two of them by Georgia O'Keeffe's friend, Ansel Adams, the famous photographer. We're going to return to this very interesting partnership in little, um, uh, in, in little sections throughout the evening. But for now, let's turn our attention to Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings from New York City, just after she got married to Alfred Stieglitz. So um, just to frame this up, Georgia O'Keeffe and Alfred Stieglitz are living at the top of a New York City skyscraper in 1925, a building that had been briefly the tallest building in the world. But there's, you know, skyscrapers going up right and left in New York City at this time. But really, this is a first. I mean, American artists hadn't lived in skyscrapers up until this moment. But for Georgia O'Keeffe, it's interesting because so many of her skyscraper pictures are um, have a perspective from the ground. She's sort of grounded as she's looking at them. Now, before we talk about this picture called New York Street with Moon from 1925, I want to share a brief anecdote that sort of speaks to this power dynamic in the marriage. Georgia O'Keeffe creates this picture and um, 
And she wants her husband to include it in a group exhibition that year. And he says to her, and I'm paraphrasing with all of this, essentially men, male artists are still struggling to figure out how to paint skyscrapers. Why don't you stick to the flower paintings? Um, and then the following year, she wanted this work submitted again and it, and it was exhibited and it sold immediately for $1,200. And Georgia O'Keeffe wrote about this later on in her life and essentially said, you know, after that, they let me paint skyscrapers. So it sort of shows, you know, her, her husband really um, had the final say, especially early on in their relationship. So with a picture like this, what are we looking at? We're looking at this kind of convergence of buildings at a street corner. They all seem to be sort of looming over us because they have these curved cornices kind of gently coming into our space. In the distance, we see the sun setting down here and a church spire almost as if to suggest that the sun is setting on this uh, um, older form of architecture and this is our present day. Now these are looming masses. They are absolute monoliths. There are no windows. There are no doors. There's a little bit of a sense of oppression here and Georgia O'Keeffe gives us a break from these hard lines and, um, and big masses of color uh, with these circular forms with the street light and the moon peeking out from behind the clouds up here. The clouds are this kind of soft organic form that provides all this release from the pressure of, um, of you know, being down um, in and amongst these, these skyscrapers uh, down below. So George O'Keefe is going to always try and find a way to soften these forms, or another way to look at it is really to, to find a way to blend the man-made with the natural here in New York City. So the following year, she creates an image of the building that she's uh, living in, the Shelton Hotel. This is called Shelton with Sunspots. And I love the way she has captured the visual distortion that we get as we look up towards the sun. And in this case, of course, the sun is peeking around the skyscraper and it looks as though this halo of light is kind of taking a bite out of the building here. So, um, so these are ways to soften the picture, right? To have all of these beautiful kind of golden orbs in the foreground um, and to have this aura of light around the sun. Also notice that she's added in these rippling lines of steam and smoke around the building and the building itself has a little bit more character than what we saw before some rectangular windows but in essence it's still abstracted. Uh, we also see that continuing um, interest in symmetry that we saw going back a decade ago at the University of Virginia, the abstraction of forms and this interest in symmetry. It's kind of holding on. Now this next image is may not be as well known in terms of her skyscraper pictures. This one is from the Minneapolis um, Institute of Arts. It's called City Night from 1926. And so we have these two huge black buildings here. And when I say they're looming, they most certainly are. There's um, there's actually a vertical convergence that's happening here. That If these lines were to extend, they would intersect with each other. And of course, buildings are not built this way. This is a distortion that's actually caused from modern photography. So, um, so she probably looked through the lens of somebody's camera, perhaps her husband's, and got that, that, that kind of, um, that sense of dizziness of vertigo by by um, by that distortion that makes it look like these buildings are sort of going to uh, 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 inter interlock or, or um, co combine together in some way. So once again, she finds a way to to give some relief and to soften uh, with a little bit of starlight, some moonlight down here, and one electric light. Now I want to note very quickly too um, about how she's painting these because the style here is called precisionism. And perhaps the best way to understand it and to appreciate it is that it's a real rejection of, um, of the painterly quality of something like American Impressionism. This is a picture, a painting of New York City by the American artist Child Hassam from about a decade before Georgia O'Keeffe's painting over here. And this is all about broken, visible brush strokes, building up um, this thick layer of paint on the surface of the can uh, of the canvas, and um, and so a lot of this is not going for um, detail or preciseness. It's going for. Um, 
well, it's an, it's an attempt to capture an impression. But with Georgia O'Keeffe's painting, we get the sense that she is making something that's clean, almost austere, almost something that looks like it's been printed uh, or mechanically made as opposed to made by hand. So there's a truly a different aim with this type of picture. Now here we have our first painting from her that we're looking at that seems to have been made from uh, the vantage point of her skyscraper. And it's very much influenced by her husband's photography. This is an Alfred Stieglitz photograph over here. And this is a Georgia O'Keeffe painting on the right. These are both scenes of the East River from the Shelton Hotel, um, both of them from 1926. So you can see that the black and white photography has certainly inspired her color palette here. It's all gray tones. Um, it's this interest in the mix of these industrial industrial buildings and, um, and the sense of softness from the weather and the steam and the fog and the smoke over here. Uh, she's obviously tilted this long canvas sideways in order to create this, um, this horizontal landscape over here. To me, this picture just does not sing in the same way that the skyscraper pictures do. And I always sort of get the sense that she's you know, like a square peg fit, trying to fit into a round hole here. It just, it isn't quite right. Um, but at least um, she and her husband are kind of in dialogue artistically. Um, in terms of their marriage, things were not as harmonious at this time. She told him that she was ready to have a child and he emphatically told her that that was not going to happen. He already had an adult daughter from his previous marriage, and he was just kind of done having children. So at this point in her life, she's in her mid-30s. She kind of has to confront um, what the rest of her life is going to look like if she's not going to have a family. And these are questions essentially every single woman has to, has to contend with these days. Do you have a family? Do you have a career? How can you split the difference? Uh, well, uh, Alfred Stieglitz essentially made a, a big choice for her. And so she turned her, her attentions to, to painting completely. Um, this next work I wanted to share with you really quickly. This is from the um, New Jersey State Museum. And you can see that she's still using this industrial landscape that her husband had photographed, but she's adding in the Georgia O'Keeffe elements over here, the sunspots, um, some interesting colors. And she just makes what to me is a much much more interesting picture than that grayscale landscape that we saw before. So we'll finish up her with her work in New York with her most celebrated skyscraper painting. This is the Radiator Building from 1927. And um, this is at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at a skyscraper straight on. We're not on the ground. We're not high up in another skyscraper looking down at it. I think if you sort of cut uh, this picture in half and you were to only look at the bottom half, it would just be a really nice geometric abstraction. We've got this variety of rectangular windows on the buildings. They're lit up with different colored lights. And then we've got the kind of soft glow of the electric street lights, ju just the, the, um, the circular orbs here down below. But we up above, we've got all this interesting variety. We've got this kind of Art Deco, neo-Gothic top to the building here. And then interestingly, we have Alfred Stieglitz's name in red neon lights over here on the left. That did not exist in New York City at the time. And some art historians sort of say that, that, um, that this is like a portrait of her husband in some ways. And they've even said that the building itself or the interesting top of this building is like a, a self portrait by Georgia O'Keeffe. I don't see it in the building as much as perhaps in um, this wisp of steam coming off of the skyscraper on the other side. So a, sort of a counterpoint to the Alfred Stieglitz over here, we have these beautiful undulating lines um, blending in with these dramatic diagrams diagonal bold lines over here. They almost look like searchlights in the distance. And, um, and so we have this wonderful abstraction here with this, with this softness that she was always trying to find in the city. So perhaps this is her self-portrait and this is his self-portrait functioning in this kind of celebration of New York City. And it is worth noting, these skyscraper pictures are celebrations. Um, the things that were happening in New York City, the building, just the very 
building that was happening in New York City in the 1920s functioned as um, this point of pride for the entire country. It was a point of pride for like American ingenuity, really. I mean, buildings like this weren't being built all over the world. This was this was an American um, innovation and they were really celebrated in her paintings. But of course, all of that changes in 1929 when the stock market crashes, they become um, symbols of failure, really. And she's not that interested in painting skyscrapers after that. Incidentally, it's 19. 29 when Georgia O'Keeffe uh, goes to New Mexico with uh, a few friends. Now, this wasn't her very first time there, but this time had a huge impact on her. So um, we'll also see that it has a huge impact on her artwork too. She said, I loved it immediately. And from then on, I was always on my way back. So let's take a look at what's happening with her painting when she gets to New Mexico. There is, um, there, it's like a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the elements get boiled away. We are just moving towards abstraction here. And, um, and so here we're looking at a picture called Black Mesa Landscape from 1930. So let's walk through this Southwestern landscape that she's painted here. We've got the strip of uh, yellow, yellow and green here in the foreground with just a few wisps of, um, of tree trunks down below to uh, give us a sense that we've got this greenery that we would walk through and then just beyond it is this peachy orangey hill with all of these kind of deep uh, 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 crevices carved into it from, um, from, run, from runoff from the rain. And the more I look at that peachy uh, fleshy color here, the more it looks like something organic, almost like a pile of bed sheets with a body underneath it. There is something um, that seems to be, she, she makes it alive really. There's something really wonderful about it. And then um, just beyond it, there's some purple, some black hills, and then these wonderful kind of purple periwinkle and blue mountains in the background. So while she's in New Mexico, she finds this landscape that she really connects to. She said, when I got to New Mexico, that was mine. As soon as I saw it, that was my country. I'd never seen anything like it before. And it fitted to me exactly. What a wonderful feeling. So let's see what else happens as she's painting in New Mexico. This is the Rancho's church that she um, uh, paints in 1929. And um, she does a couple versions of this church. Now, just to get you oriented, what we are looking at is the back of, a, of an adobe style church here. So this is sort of wings going off of the front of the building. And this would almost be like the apse or the curved back. So, um, so what we're, what we're actually seeing in the painting is really like abstracted forms. And what, what George O'Keefe would have loved about this is that there's almost no delineation between the land and the architecture. It's one, it's harmonious. Um, the architecture seems in and of the land. That's like the, the balance that she was trying to strike by, uh, by her, with her paintings of New York City skyscrapers. She also loved to paint um, the crosses in the Southwest. Uh, these are both crosses from 1929. Um, this is called Black Cross New Mexico and over here Black Cross with stars and blue. So with both of these works, she's using the, this, this kind of black monolithic form as, um, as a way to kind of frame up her picture. Notice how she's using the horizontal element over here to squeeze out this brilliant little landscape in the distance. And as one art historian put it, all of these gray hills um, in the middle ground here look like a pack of 100 uh, elephants. I don't think I could ever see it any other way except that. And then um, and then with both of these works, you, you notice also the pegs that were used to construct the cross itself. Over here, we've got, you know, this, this strength of this bold um, black cross in the foreground. And then it's almost functioning like a window pane to this other um, really sort of peaceful, tranquil space with the, with the stars in the sky and this beautiful purple mountain in the distance. Um, 
Georgia O'Keefe said, I saw the crosses so often and often in unexpected places, like a thin dark veil of the Catholic church spread over the New Mexico landscape. To me, they were sort of softened versions of those New York City skyscrapers, um, something that seemed, again, it, more harmonious with to the landscape that they were a part of. Now, another famous work that she created from this period, these early years in New Mexico is the Lawrence tree. This is a favorite for a lot of people. This is um, named after the art, the um, author D.H. Lawrence, who was also um, living in New Mexico at the time with his wife. They had a little cabin there and Georgia O'Keeffe and her friends went to go visit. Uh, D.H. Lawrence was somebody who was writing about the dehumanization of um, of society because of, of modernity and industrialization. So you can imagine he and Georgia O'Keeffe were just like-minded kindred spirits. And just outside of his cabin door, there was this huge ponderosa pine. George O'Keefe went and laid down on a bench just under the tree, looked up through these kind of undulating octopus-like arms of, of, uh, of the tree branches here through the pines and to the night sky, and then um, conjured this painting as a response to that experience. And I have to say, this is a really powerful image. I think that this image kind of transports you to that feeling of, of being in nature, maybe in the middle of the summer, um, when the air is starting to cool just at, at, at nighttime and feeling like every breath that you take is like that of, of the freshest, cleanest air, um, the, the air that smells like nature itself. And then this, this particular angle here, looking up this tree trunk makes you feel like just so connected to this tree, connected to the outdoors. Um, I, I could take a deep breath right now and, and just smell <laughs> the space that she has captured here. It is really powerful. Um, she uses, you know, a very similar angle with some of her New York City paintings, but you don't quite get um, that that wonderful sense of being there in the same way that you do with the Lawrence tree over here. Now, incidentally, as I was doing research for this, for this program, I, I thought to myself, I have seen this painting in so many, hung in so many different configurations or um, online presented in, in, um, in a variety of ways. So I did a quick Google image search to sort of see you know, are people misrepresenting the way this painting is supposed to be oriented? And you can see, I mean, it, it's that tree trunk is coming from every single corner here. Uh, now, this painting is actually in the collection of the um, Wadsworth Athenaeum down in Hartford, Connecticut. And they actually hang this painting as you see over here. Um, and apparently Georgia O'Keeffe sort of loved the notion that the painting kind of works no matter which orientation um, you hang it from. And, and so she approved the way uh, the, the Wadsworth Athenaeum was displaying this work of art. But incidentally, that was not how it was painted. I find that really interesting. You don't hear about that sort of thing too often. In, in art history. So we're going to take a brief pause on New Mexico for just one moment to sort of uh, flash sideways to uh, back to her relationship and what was happening here. Because as she, as she falls in love with New Mexico, uh, she begins to travel there for many months every single year. It, um, there's like an annual pilgrimage to New Mexico, and it's a lot of time away from her husband. So what we're looking at here is a little love note that she left him. It's Says, hello, I kiss you. And she would write these notes and hide them all over the apartment for him to discover while she was gone. And what he would do is he would write a little note on it saying, found in my slippers and do the date here. And so even while they were gone, even while they were away from each other, they wrote to each other constantly. Over the course of 30 years, they wrote 25,000 pages of, of letters to each other. So they were always in constant contact. And, um, and, and you might think, okay, well, apparently 
absence doesn't make the heart absent, <laughs> but perhaps in their case, it does. They stayed connected, but Alfred Stieglitz was, um, was already having an affair with another woman, even before Georgia O'Keeffe uh, went off to New Mexico for the first time. Uh, he met Dorothy Norman, or he started the affair with Dorothy Norman in 1927. This is a photograph he took of her. Here they are together. She was 21 years old when, um, when they first met and she was married to someone else as well. She began to play a role in his business, in his galleries, in his publications, and was sort of tied to him, um, not just in a romantic affair, but also a, in like an administrative capacity. Now, all of this took a tremendous toll on Georgia O'Keeffe. She developed depression. She developed um, a lot of sort of neuroses, some fears. She, uh, she became... Um, fearful of buildings collapsing of her uh, on her she developed an aversion to water no wonder she wanted to go to the desert and she found that for long stretches she was unable to eat and sleep ultimately in 1933 she has a mental breakdown and is hospitalized for two months and then spends a, a great deal of time almost a year i believe afterwards kind of recovering from this completely and her breakdown also kind of functioned as a break, breakthrough in terms of her artwork, because I think it's sort of around this time that she decides that she's going to define herself and sort of dictate her terms as an artist, at least um, much more so than she had been doing prior to that. So, um, so at this point, her work really becomes associated with the desert. And so these are two iconic works from the 1930s. This one is at the Whitney Museum over here. This is at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And both of them feature these animal skulls that are hanging in the air above these kind of miniature um, desert landscapes down below. And both of them have these flowers that kind of function as garnishes in these pictures. So what are these pictures really about? They're unusual. I mean, I think when you first see them too, they're, they're, um, they're foreboding. But Georgia O'Keeffe would be the first person to tell you that her bone pictures were not about death um, in the same way that her flower pictures were not about sex. So you, you got to take her word on this. Georgia O'Keeffe really loved the, um, the visual appeal of bleached out white animal bones. She loved the opening. She loved these undulating lines. Um, for her, they really kind of function like the flowers of the desert. So, um, so with these pictures, she would start off with the animal skulls and then just add in other components as she, um, as she ran into them throughout the day. Oh, I saw this flower, I'll add it in. Now, some people might be wondering at this point, was Georgia O'Keeffe a little bit of a surrealist? Is she dabbling in surrealism? It's the 1930s. Uh, she did have a few paintings that were exhibited in surrealist exhibitions, but I think that was before she even knew what surrealism was. A few years later, when she was asked, are you a surrealist artist? Um, her response, and I just absolutely love it, was, I'm not a joiner. <laughs> so I think that tells us a lot about George O'Keefe. But she did love these bones. She loved walking through the desert, finding them, picking them up, and bringing them home. To her, walking through the desert and finding bones was like for, I think, most other people, walking through a field of flowers and picking up just the, the right ones that appeal to you most. Look at how happy she is in this photograph over here. She's holding an animal head in her hands. There's still flesh on that skull over there. Um, incidentally, this photograph was taken by Ansel Adams as well. This is a photograph from a few decades later, the 1960s, at one of her homes called uh, a ghost ranch. And, um, and here she is surrounded by more bones. This was taken by Todd Webb. So even in the 1940s, she's continuing to paint animal bones. She does a whole series on these pelvic bones. Um, and, and over here in on the left, this is a work from the Indianapolis Museum of Art, where we can see a lot of the bone and how it's kind of hanging over the, um, the southwestern landscape over here too. It's monumental in 
scale and it's set against this um, this crisp blue sky here at the center with a work from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The bones are even larger. Um, we're right up next to them and we just get this little piece of blue sky to look at through them. And then over here with a work that's at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, um, we're looking almost as though we're looking through at a skull through the eye, eye socket of a skull here. Um, she's even added like a, a little suggestion of, of an eyeball with a very pale moon here. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe, I think she really likes blue skies. She once said she could go to jail just as long as she had a little slice of blue sky to look at. Uh, but I think what's really happening with these pictures is kind of her formal experiments that we saw with the flowers too. She's zooming in on things. She's making them ab abstract. She's making them monumental and she's making us consider them in whole new ways. Um, one uh, art historian put it in such lovely terms that uh, essentially Georgia O'Keeffe is forcing us to consider the universe through the portal of a bone. So lovely. Now she, like I said, she said these were not about death, but I think this one skull picture, you can't avoid it. This is about death. This is um, Head with a Broken Pot from 1943. We won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it's, uh, it's a different kind of picture. It, this is like a traditional Vanitas picture that's to remind us that that life is short um uh that you know all things are, are are transient and i use this as a little bit of a segue to talk about um uh, George O'Keefe's husband, because in 1946, he suffers a heart attack. Georgia O'Keefe is in New Mexico. He's in New York City. Incidentally, he never went out to New Mexico with her. Um, and as soon as she found out what happened to him, she dropped everything and goes back to New Mexico and he died, or sorry, back to New York. And he dies um, shortly thereafter. Immediately following his death, she takes full control over his um, over his body of work, over all of his business dealings, and she's really taking them back from Dorothy Norman, um, the woman he's been having an affair with for um, almost two decades at this point. So um, she's really kind of seizing her control as his legal wife, and um, and she's deciding what happens with his legacy. She donates about um, half of his uh, entire body of work as a photographer to the National Gallery of Art, thereby sort of setting into concrete uh, his legacy, how he will be regarded. She takes full control over his gallery at the time, and I'm sure over um, whatever publications he was working on, and she takes three full years to settle his estate. Now, here's the woman who had been controlled for so long, had been managed for so long. And now she gets to make all these decisions. Uh, her career is on fire at this point. She's got solo exhibitions at the Art Institute of Chicago, at, um, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and at the Museum of Modern Art as well. So, um, so she is sort of at the height of her career, and she is newly independent, um, newly widowed. And so what does she do? She buys the ruins of a hacienda in New Mexico, in Abiquiu, New Mexico, at the same year that her husband passes away. And as she takes three years to settle his, his estate, she, um, she has this hacienda renovated um, to fit her perfectly, just like New Mexico fit her perfectly. Incidentally, she said she had to buy this property because it had a door on the patio that she just had to paint. <laughs> so, uh, so here she is in 1948 in the midst of all of um, the work being done on this property. It's a 5,000 square foot property that she was to live in by herself. So here we can see what it looks like when it's renovated in this traditional adobe style. We're looking into her bedroom over here. And in this next photograph, we're in her bedroom looking out at these hills in the desert. And you can see sort of this, how they're sort of beautifully framed by these windows. It almost makes you want to start painting them yourself. Um, other rooms in her house show you how, um, 
how the building was designed to keep her feeling connected to nature. Her furnishings were very humble, very simple. Um, it's all about that, that view outside and that connection to the desert that she loves so much. All right, so in our last few moments, what we're going to do is turn our attention to her work in other media. So we're going to start off with photography. Maybe some of you have been over to the Addison Gallery to see their little exhibition on Georgia O'Keeffe as a photographer. What's important to know here is that Georgia O'Keeffe was one of the most photographed women of the 20th century. And in the second half of her life, the second half of her career, she was very careful in cultivating a very particular image, the kind of image that you see in these, in these photographs. This is a photo from Vogue magazine over here, an image from Life magazine. She is serious. She's not frivolous. She wears black and white, almost like a pilgrim, you know? Um, and all of this, I think, is in some ways to really counteract the way her career started with kind of scand scandalous imagery. Um, here she is, she's an artist, and it doesn't matter that she's a woman artist, she wants to be taken seriously. Now, this does uh, mean that she sort of inadvertently, or maybe on purpose, develops a little bit of a reputation of being an old crab who lives off in the desert, a little bit of a hermit. Um, but take a look at how she changes when she gets behind the camera. Look at the smile on her face. Her friend, photographer Todd Webb, talked about the day that she bought her first Polaroid camera and described her as like a kid on Christmas. Now, of course, Georgia O'Keeffe has been around cameras since the 19 teens when she first met her husband. But later on in her life, I think the camera opens up some other sort of creative opportunities for her that are just fun. So she goes out into the desert with, photogra with her photographer friends and they're snapping pictures all along the way. I think in some ways, this almost it becomes like picking up bones or picking up flowers. Snapping pictures is a new form of collection for her. Now, for many painters, uh, photography is always part of the process. It's usually the starting point. In Georgia O'Keeffe's, uh, uh, well, in her example, uh, it's sometimes uh, an opportunity to circle back to things that you love. She painted this picture of the Jimson weed in 1932. She took the photograph about three decades later. And I can imagine her delight in sort of thinking, I can frame this, I can crop this, I can zoom in and do this all so quickly. Where Whereas I kind of labored over the painting uh, from so many years earlier. She used the camera to capture that patio door that she loved so well. Um, she, I, I think she said, I'm always trying to paint that, that door and I never quite get it. So it seemed to almost torment her in, in this media as well. Um, here's just a look at some of the paintings that she did of that door just very quickly. Uh, she painted this one door 22 times, incidentally. I love both of these pictures. This is from 1956. It's the door through these window panes and the door in the snow from 1955. Um, she would go back to the same subject again and again. And like many modernist photographers, she's interested in the play of light and dark, this play of shadows here, just the ladder up against the wall of her, of her home. Uh, look here to see how the, the shadow of the ladder uh, leads our eye to what else? I think this is a pile of bones. It's very Georgia. O'Keefe. And it, so what would she do with these photographs? She wasn't doing formal prints of them. She wasn't trying to take the perfect photograph and make the perfect print from it. She would print contact sheets, essentially all of the film together. And then she would give it away to friends or she would use it as a bookmark. This I, this I think was more or less fun experiments for her. She also made a few sculptures along the way. Um, this is an early sculpture from 1916. You can see that it sort of seems to be in dialogue with some of the abstract drawings she was doing at this time. And I wonder if Alfred Stieglitz sort of pushed her to create works in three dimensions to kind of round out her body of work. This is simply called abstraction. Um, and I think it's a really moving work because it was created uh, just after the death of her mother. And so you can sort of read it as like a shrouded or like a veiled figure in mourning here. It's really powerful. This is um, 
white lacquer on bronze. So she would have made a maquette for it, probably in clay, and then it would have been cast by somebody else. Uh, in 1946, so 30 years later, she creates another at, uh, work called Abstraction. And this one is this kind of looping spiral form. It starts off with a circle and a looping form that comes around it and then twists back onto itself into another curve here. This is um, a work that seems to be in dialogue with so many of these kind of spiraling white forms that are in her paintings. Um, it, uh, interestingly enough, it's, uh, it's, it's not a perfect spiral though. It's, it's kind of something else. Uh, it's also white lacquered bronze. And, and once again, she would have created the maquette and had somebody else cast it. Uh, she had it cast in three different sizes all the way up to, I, I think it's 118 um, inches tall. And here she is sort of striking dramatic poses with each of these sculptures. If anybody on tonight has, has ever seen one of these in person, I would love to know where they are. I can't track them down. Um, but really striking, it's a striking form. And I think they sort of, it, it, whatever um, dimension it's in, whatever size it's in, I think they sort of function like those uh, paintings of pelvic bones. It's something to look at and through at the same time. But we're, so, we're going to wrap up her experiments in other media with her work in clay. And we're, this also provides a nice sort of bookend to the romantic scandal that started her career because we're gonna end with one too. Here she is in both of these photographs with a potter who, um, Oh, really helped her in this medium. She started uh, pottery when she was 83 years old, and it was Juan Hamilton that sort of guided her through this. He was a young man, 58 years younger than her, actually, who encouraged her, um, but he first came into her life hoping to be sort of like a hired man um, at her home, and she would have none of it. She sent him away so many times, and then eventually he kind of like wormed his way in. They became good friends. He uh, he was working for her and with his background in pottery, he introduced her to it. Then they became good friends, um, companions. And, and there was a lot of talk about the nature of their relationship. And she just said, let them talk. She, um, she let everybody wonder. So they worked together and, um, and in, you know, in her eighties, she's creating these beautiful forms, which I think have um, so much to do with the kinds of forms that she'd been painting and drawing throughout her career. This is a woman who had a collection of her favorite rocks. This is her holding her very favorite rock over here. Um, so these were these kind of smooth, slightly imperfect vessels that, um, that related so well to like the bones and the rocks that she loved in the desert. So um, we'll wrap up her, her experiments in pottery with just a, a quick note in terms of how this relationship with Juan Hamilton ends, because he is with her um, right up until the end of her life. She dies at the age of 98. And at that time, her estate is worth $76 million. Um, says a lot about how she managed her money and about her reputation, even while she was alive. She bequeathed almost all of her belongings and her money to Juan Hamilton, and it created quite a sensation. Um, he ended up giving most of it uh, back to the Georgia O'Keeffe Foundation. He said he wanted to get by on his wits and his work, but he's still a special consultant to that foundation. Needless to say, um, uh, this incident prompted a lot of conversations about estate planning afterwards, but a lot of people assumed that he was he was some kind of uh, fraud, that he was trying to uh, befriend her to get her money. But it, 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 I would seem that it, it would seem that that is not the case. Um, so let's turn our attention to uh, the, the very last few years of her life. Uh, she I think one of the reasons she was drawn to pottery is because her eyesight was failing. She had macular degeneration as early as the 1970s. So these are some watercolors. They're all untitled that she was doing in the final decade or so of her life. And they are so striking and so beautiful, just powerful forms, really simple forms. Every time I look at them, I want to go out and buy a watercolor set and just be able to do this wonderful sort of flying white 
um, brushstroke that she's kind of mastered over here in the center with these beautiful colors. So, um, so because she had this long life and this very long career, she had the pleasure of being celebrated, of being toasted um, during her lifetime. She won the um, the national, uh, sorry, it's the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Gerald Ford in 1977, and also the National Medal of Arts from Ronald Reagan in 1985. Uh, also, this whole wave of feminist artists in the 1970s were celebrating her. This is a collage by an artist named Mary Beth Edelson. This is at the Smithsonian Institute and, it, and it's just a recognition of some living American women artists. And look who is at the center of this in this kind of send up of Da Vinci's Last Supper. George O'Keefe is the Jesus here. <laughs> she is the trailblazer. She's the person everybody's looking to. Judy Chicago made her famous feminist dinner party that's in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum of Art completed in 1979. She created um, individualized place settings for important women from the history of art and, and, um, and culture. And if she couldn't squeeze them in for a place setting, she would add their name to the tiles in the center right here. Here, Georgia O'Keeffe gets her own special setting with, um, with a plate that was inspired by her flower paintings, complete with um, <laughs> what seems like an anatomical opening here. Uh, the, uh, the, the fabric uh, placemat here also has her name embroidered along with some um, animal horns in this case. So uh, one last work that honors Georgia O'Keeffe in such a wonderful way, this was actually created after her death. The artist here is um, David P. Bradley. This is in the collection of the Denver Museum of Art. And you can see that he is, um, he's kind of recreating that famous painting by Whistler, uh, the painting of his mother, uh, seated in profile. So Georgia O'Keeffe is, um, is portrayed with these kind of puritanical colors that she liked to wear, but surrounded by all the things that she loved. Uh, the flowers, the rocks, the crosses, the mesas, the church in the background here. I think it's a wonderful way to honor her. But even in the last few years of her life, Georgia O'Keeffe was kind of living her best life. Here she is just hanging out with Andy Warhol in the few years before her death. Can you imagine? I mean, she was uh, she was so celebrated, so highly regarded at this point that, you know, this person who was obsessed with fame and celebrity, Andy Warhol, wanted to spend his time with her. So this is like a great who's who in terms of American art history right here. So Georgia O'Keeffe, like I said, passes away at the age of 98. This was in 19 1986. 11 years later, there was a museum founded in her honor um, and is a, a huge repository of, of her works. And when you go to visit it, you can see uh, this little table set up with the actual um, uh, 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 items she would use to create works of art and be inspired by. So I always like to look at um, at auction prices too, to sort of assess where someone's legacy stands. That Jimson weed painting that we'd seen earlier today is, um, is actually the, um, the work of art that has fetched the highest price at auction. It was purchased by the Crystal Bridges Museum in 2014, and it sold for $44 million, the highest price ever paid for a woman artist. Now that all sounds really well and good, but her friend Andy Warhol has had works of art that have sold for well over a hundred thousand dollars. So even in death, female artists, women artists are only making a fraction of what uh, male artists are only bringing in a fraction of what male artists um, are able to do. So we will wrap up tonight um, looking at this extraordinary woman who succeeded in a male dominated field and then was ultimately able to carve out the life she desired out there in the desert of New Mexico. Now, during the seven, eight decade long career that she had, she, made, she created so so many iconic works, so many paintings that we still know and love so well. And I think after today's program, hopefully you agree with me that we would be doing her legacy a real disservice if we thought that Georgia O'Keeffe was only about the flowers. So I will end there for now and I welcome any questions or comments anybody has about Georgia O'Keeffe. 
And I see Elaine commented that people still have issues with, with photography. Yeah, this, <laughs> the, going back to um, uh, uh, images of nudes, I'm sure you're talking about Elaine. <laughs> um, Oh, Kathy noted the, the exhibit at the Peabody Essex Museum. And Kathy, I'm so glad you brought that up because, um, because I, it, I find it really interesting that with Georgia O'Keeffe and another woman artist, Frida Kahlo, so oftentimes you see um, exhibitions of their work that also include their, their, um, their clothes. And I know for Georgia O'Keeffe, she designed a lot of her clothes, so that makes sense. But uh, I think when we're talking about women artists, oftentimes we, we see how they present themselves to the world as an, as an extension of their artistic choices. So you just don't really see that with male artists that often. It's really interesting. But um, but I, I'm, I so like, I'm just, I, I'm so mad at myself that I missed that show, but a lot of people have mentioned it to me. So uh, um, it sounds like it was a good one. All right. Um, going through here. Thanks for, I'm seeing some kind words. I appreciate them. Um, Catherine has asked, are paintings created with oil, watercolor, wash? I know um, most of like her major works are oil paintings. It seems like she was experimenting a little bit more with watercolor to, um, in the final decades there. Um, there was a lot of watercolors in um, the first decade of her career, sort of right after um, and around um, her, her time at UVA, and they are very powerful. They're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous watercolors. I wish I could have had a whole section on them, but they didn't quite fit in with my theme, or I didn't quite know how to, um, <laughs> to integrate them into, into tonight's um, program. But I have to say, go and find her watercolors from the 19 teens, early 1920s. A lot of them are inspired by, um, by like sunrises, sunsets, um, uh, starry nights. They are gorgeous. Um, oh, thanks for the kind words. Oh, I really, well, I'm so glad people have enjoyed tonight's program. And Andrea says that she's been to the, uh, to the, um, to the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe, that it was wonderful. Um, I, that is certainly on my bucket list. I was telling my husband, we have to go to Santa Fe now. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm glad to hear that it was good, that it was a good experience for you. And um, Teresa says, is her home in New Mexico open to the public? So Georgia O'Keeffe actually had two homes in New Mexico. And the one that I showed you that she had renovated is an abiqueue. And I believe it is a part of the collection of the museum in Santa Fe. So you can go visit it. It's open to the public. Her other home that's in Ghost Ranch, which I don't think was a house that was winterized, is kind of privately operated by some denomination of, of, um, of a Christian church. So it's kind of used as, as a retreat space. But I think you can find photographs of it online too. And I think there's um, some pretty extensive bone collections that are there as well. just going through this. Uh, Kathy says she enjoyed seeing the skyscrapers. I really love those skyscraper paintings. There's, I mean, there's just nothing else like them. And to think that, you know, people were thinking, oh, men, are, men haven't even figured out how to paint these. And she, she found a, a really sort of wonderful approach to it. I, I find those pictures, they really withstand the test of time. Uh, Catherine has asked, did Georgia O'Keeffe leave journals, a biography? Please recommend a book or an author. Ooh, Catherine, um, try, you know what? I, I should have put that in my notes for tonight, but there was one major uh, biographer whose name has escaped me, who I kept referring to when I was doing my research. So I apologize offhand that her name escapes me right now. But, um, but I'm sure if you did like a quick search on Amazon, or I'm sure that there's somebody at Chelmsford who could who could do um, a good good recommendation. But there is one like primary person who's considered like the the Georgia O'Keeffe um, scholar, and I really apologize that their name escapes me at the moment. But that's a that's a really good question, and I should have that ready for next time. Um, any interactions between Georgia Georgia O'Keeffe and Andy Warhol? 
Um, Amit, I'm not sure if you're um, wondering about like artistic interactions. Did they interact that way? I know that they were friendly and that they would have dinner together and that sort of thing. Um, uh, I also know that Juan Hamilton, the young man that was friends with Georgia O'Keeffe, he had an exhibition in New York City and Andy Warhol went to the opening. So, I mean, they were, they were in each other's circles. Um, let's see, Donna has said, I enjoyed the museum in Santa Fe. And okay, so I'm glad that was a good experience for you. Let's see. Oh, okay, Dorothy has offered that Ghost Ranch does do a George O'Keefe bus tour of the property and that was great. Oh, so it sounds like a lot of people here have had some experiences down in, in the Southwest and have gotten kind of up close and personal. This is wonderful. Catherine asked, did George O'Keefe ever mentor other artists? Um, that's a really good question. And offhand, my, um, Nobody is coming to mind. <laughs> I will say she does strike me as somebody who was sort of um, resoundingly independent, <laughs> but I could be wrong on that. If anybody else knows differently, please feel free to jump in. Um, Catherine, you are full of good questions tonight and I'm sorry, I don't have answers for all of them, but she also asked what happened to Dorothy Norman? Um, <laughs> she's been relegated to the secondary status, at least in my program for tonight, um, because ultimately she couldn't decide what happened with uh, uh, everything related to Alfred Stieglitz's career, but I'm sure she's had a second act after his death. I don't know what, what happened to her though. Um, I think we should plan some sort of group trip to New Mexico to see all this stuff together. That would be so fun. Uh, Judith has asked, do you think without her husband branding, she would have had such a successful career? That is, Judith, that is the million dollar question. Um, I would tend to think no. Um, he was the person who launched, he, who launched artists. And could he have done it without um, exhib exhibiting nude photographs of her? Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, so it, these are interesting questions, but uh, you know, I, I think being in his circle was extremely advantageous for her. Um, it was like the right time, right place kind of thing. Um, but, but it's interesting to think that, you know, sort of what she did with her fame, um, with her talent, with her success and celebrity after she was launched. And then Judith also asked, who was the woman who did a documentary on her offhand? I'm not sure. I don't think I'm familiar with the documentary, but if anybody else is familiar with that, please share that. Um, Anna Pollitzer, that might be the right one. Um, oh, Elaine has shared sort of a follow-up on Dorothy Norman too. Thank you for that. Um, I think... I think Anna Pollitzer, Anita Pollitzer is the right name. Um, so thank you for adding that in. Was Dow a major influence? Did he teach Georgia O'Keeffe? Dow was a major influence on her. And there is a little um, exhibition of Dow's work that's also at the Addison right now. Um, I don't think she when she was initially exposed to his ideas, she wasn't being taught by him directly at UVA, but I think she did have direct contact with him at Teachers College in, um, at Columbia in New York City, just before she met uh, um, Alfred Stieglitz, but, but it, she would already was kind of like fully on board with his ideas at that point. So, so I think they did have direct contact. All right. So I think we've touched on most of this. I thought somebody raised their hand before. Hopefully they've, they've, um, they've been able to jump in too. Um, thank you everybody once again for sharing your time with me. Oh, I see other people raise their hands. Let's see if I can see them. Um, Judith, okay. I think we got to your questions. Does anybody else have their hand raised? Let's see sort of a funny system here in order and I don't see anybody else. Okay, so um, so I think we've answered most everybody. Lisa Volp, that is, that's, that's the, um, I, I would say she's probably one of the best known um, uh, writers, art historians related to, um, 
to George O'Keefe. I would, I would start with her. So everybody, thanks for diving in and doing the research um, in, in the midst of the chat. I appreciate that. Um, thank you everybody again. And I look forward to connecting with you next month when we're talking about earth art. Um, that should be a really fun program. So as always, I, I really appreciate your time and your attention and your very kind words at the end of the programs. I always look forward to working with you. So, um, so thank you again, and we'll see you next month. Have a great night, everybody.